it's, uh, it's very nice to um, meet my fans, both of them. <laughs> How much of your own experiences did you put into the film? Other the designers and the technicians build a set inside an old house in Notting Hill to replicate the house that, that I had lived in in Camden Town. And it was literally, at the time, around with now and I, I mean, it was really, you know, do I have 10 fags or do I get fish and chips? We were so utterly uh, broke. I had one light bulb I used to go around the house with and I used to go down the Odeon to get a toilet roll, nick one from the local Odeon in Camden Town. It was, it was a pretty, actually, terrible time in some ways, but also rather a remarkable time because there was incredible freedom um and you know it was it was the late 60s there was lots of what used to be known as pot in those days lots of pot about everywhere you went someone was smoking a joint and you know it was a uh, this was pretty accurate how it was and i remember somebody in america saying to me but you know he's got a 2500 dollar brass bed uh, the Marwood character in his bedroom, which is to kind of fail to understand what London was like in the 60s. There were incredible junk shops. I mean, they'd be called antique shops now. That brass bed, not the actual one in the film, but one very similar to it, I bought for 10 bob in Ramsgate, uh, which was my bed throughout, uh, throughout this period. Uh, and that kitchen... Um, was very much like it. That, that was like it. We used to get wine by uh, going around all the litter bins in Cannon Town, pulling out the uh, empty beer bottles, Guinness bottles. You used to get fourpence on them. And when you've got <laughs> an enormous cargo of empty beer bottles over to the off-licence for the cheapest uh, bottle of, I think I described it as, was it Greek hock? But it was something like that. And then we get a bottle of wine and then we'd sit up all night with only one bottle of wine and a roll up, you know, a bit of pot and talk all night. And um, I had not had any kind of, I mean, I was very lucky in many ways because the school I went to, there was no education, but there was a school play. And that's how I kind of got into the idea of of wanting to be an actor, which had brought me to this very flat after having gone to drama school with the other guy, portrayed here by Richard E., uh, whose name was Vivian, and he was my closest friend and bitterest enemy, and we loved and hated. What films, books, books inspired you most during the writing process? Well, a multiplicity of them, but Baudelaire, once I discovered Baudelaire, it was like a big light going on in, in in my life, in a sense. And indeed, the first screenplay that I ever wrote, totally, you know, I mean, I didn't know how to write a script, but I, the first thing I ever wrote was uh, a, a film about Baudelaire. I, I'd read about his life and stuff, so I, so I wrote about him. This scene, which is pretty well made up, except for one line that a wanker uh aggressed me in a pub and tore my ta tartan scarf off one day in uh pardon me, what's your name my fuck like that and uh, uh i'm afraid coward that i am i ran for it all the way up parkway but the line stayed in my head for years until i came until i came to to write this scene what's your name my fuck uh there's a typical wanker there lovely actor Mr. O'Malley. I said, was anything improvised in the movie? Nothing was, except in th that scene. But in that scene, Richard had a piece of um, pastry from the pie stuck in his teeth. And there were only two times that there was something in the film that, we, that wasn't scripted and I couldn't get rid of. One of them was that, I have to say, it was the only time I kind of buckled up behind the camera. It just amused me, this piece of pie. And we'll get to the other time that we had uh, a real difficulty with something that wasn't scripted. Other than that, yeah, it was all scripted. It was pretty... I, I, there is no improvisation in this film at all. Um, 
I don't know, I'm not saying improvisation is good, bad or indifferent, but in this I wanted it to be, it was all very, very closely rehearsed. The only way actually uh, that we could get, get shoot it in 30 days was because we rehearsed it all. So we get on the set and we know, all know what we were doing, everybody, uh, and we get it one, two, three takes and we were on and moving on. Otherwise we never got through the movie. Paul got the part when he walked through the door, you know, he, he was perfect. He was, he was just... He looked like a young actor. He's a very good actor. Um, he he just was perfect for it. But um, I I actually so he got the part, and then about a week or two later, I had to fire him. And look, I don't know if I really meant to fire him. I don't know if that was true. But you know, he had a kind of he was a bit of a scouser, Paul. You know, sorry, forgive my impression of scouse, but. And he wouldn't get rid of this accent. And the whole point was, you know, uh, Withnell is uh, an Exitonian twerp. And he's a, he's a grammar school boy from the home counties, Marwood. Um, and that's kind of an important element in the film, this class thing. And he wouldn't get rid of this bloody uh, Liverpool accent. And I freaked out one day and said, oh, fuck it, I can't make this film if you're going to do that all the time. So either stop it or bollocks to it. And so, um, so he wouldn't, or he couldn't, or whatever happened. And so for about three days, he got fired. But he had to come back because he was very right for it. Uh, why did Ringo Starr get a consultant credit on the film? It was because Handmade Films was owned by George Harrison, who was a genuinely fabulous bloke. He was such a lovely man. And uh, and Ringo, obviously, is, uh, they had an association at one point in their lives. And so Ringo came down to the set, pissed as I was, uh, didn't know what the fuck was going on. But anyway, that's why Ringo gets the consultant credit. So what was your favourite line in the movie? Well, I liked We've Gone on Holiday by Mistake. Uh, but my favourite line is, um, I feel unusual, which which made me laugh out loud when I wrote the line. I had I said I had this old Olivetti that I used to work on in the kitchen in Camden Town. And uh, it was such fun writing this because cause I didn't give a fuck. I mean, it wasn't like I, later on, you know, if someone's actually paying you to write something, it's much harder in a way because, you know, they've, they've put the dough up. So you care more, you know, and you're more anxious about it. With Withnell and I, I was just writing my life at the time uh, and having a good laugh. Oh, shit. Oh, sorry. I keep swearing and I don't mean to. Um, I'm sorry for swearing. In fact, there's a question here um, about swearing. Nick Griffiths. Nick says... It's said that people who profane liberally do so because they lack the vocabulary. I would vehemently fucking dis disagree. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know. I think it's bollocks. I think that people... What's wrong with swearing? I mean, Christ, I don't know. I don't know. Why do people... Why is it all right to say damned but not fucking. Anyway, everyone says it. I don't know why they even pretend that they don't say it. The only thing that I don't like is too much use in the media or in movies or, God forbid, television of the uh, the uh, C word. Because the more, the more these words are used, including fucking, but the C word, it diminishes its power if it becomes... if it becomes sort of just the norm, the horrible word. It diminishes its power, and we haven't got a more powerful word in the English language than the C word. Here's the old roller. This was shot in um, Norfolk. And Richard was such a large actor, they had to take all the seats out of the rolls and put a special seat in so he could go along and drive it. How did you get a strict teetotal of Richard E. Grant to understand what it's like to be drunk? The answer was by getting him drunk. We were down at Shepperton Studios one day and uh, Richard truly is a teetotal. I don't think he's barely tasted alcohol in his life. And we uh, 
drank, had a bottle of champagne and a bottle of vodka and he, and he very quickly got drunk, spewed all over the place, which I have to say I had to clear up. It was my fault, I guess. And and I and I sort of I would I I was sort of uh, I called it like a chemical memory, which is a bit facetious. But it, you know, if you've never been drunk, you don't know what it's like to be drunk. And the whole point about about being drunk successfully on screen, I think, is when you when you try not to be drunk. What was inside the Campbellwell carrot? Uh, I think it was herbal tobacco. <laughs> I think it was herbal. It most certainly wasn't marijuana. Uh, it's a very hard thing to to laugh um, spontaneously, uh, which Richard has to do in this scene where he falls off the, uh, the sofa and laughs. I think we had to overdub him and to help, but it's very difficult to do. Where did you find Withnell's Jaguar and what happened to it? I don't know what happened to it. When the, the real Jaguar, the one I was talking about earlier, that we took up to the Lake District, it got stuck in a ditch and the farmer with his tractor tried to pull it out and pulled the entire front of the car off. And we had to <laughs> drive back to London with half the car sticking out the rear window. Remember that? You know what? We never knew it. I said when we were making the film... God's honour, this is true. I said to my wife, oh God, I pray we can get two weeks at the Gate Cinema and nothing ill with it because uh, there was another question here uh, which is apposite to this uh, about is it true that the, um, the first screening of the film, we were half an hour in and I'm sitting there with Paul, the producer, and not laugh one nothing and I just oh my god I completely blown this this is a disaster and and it was like that all the way through the movie at the end of the movie I was told that the person who had organized the screening had gone to a language school around the corner in Soho and the whole room was full of German students who couldn't speak a word of English who were in England to learn English <coughs> and of course, Whistnell and I is all about language. That's that's it. That's what it's got. And I've only ever fired two people in my life, and that was one. There, I was so infuriated and enraged that that anyone would have been that fucking stupid. But anyway, so she got fired. Um, it didn't do very well when it opened uh, uh, in, in the cinema, but it did. It, it, why? Why? I've often sort of thought, what, what is it? What is it? The, whatever it is, it's by accident. It truly is by accident. But what I think the accident is, is that Withnell and I touches that moment in all our lives of magnificent anarchy. And on that note, au revoir.